not the causative term. And therefore we say, we do it. So whether I understand it or I don't understand it, I haven't stopped eating uh, just because I don't know how my digestive system works. And if I'm going to wait till I would know how it works, I will never have to eat. Um, so the, the point is then with religion the same thing. So here we talk about physical food, there we talk about spiritual food. That we say that this has an effect upon the neshama, which has an effect upon the, the character, which has an effect upon the whole personality, etc. How, why, etc., etc., I don't know. Um, but that, that's the reality. That's how we speak about the 248 mitzvahs asay, corresponding to the 248 limbs in the body. The 365 mitzvahs lois asay, corresponding to the 365 sinews in the body. Which means every mitzvah has its own part, its own component in the, in the body. That it has not only a spiritual effect, it also has a physical effect as well. Uh, that's why we speak about children before bar mitzvah, bar mitzvah, technically can go to McDonald's. Nothing wrong. They can have bacon and eggs for breakfast, they can enjoy themselves to whatever they want. Allah, they are not subject to mitzvahs. But we say that they should not do so. The parents must prevent them from doing so. Why? Because even though they are not legally liable for anything, they are not committing a sin. But in the meantime, that non-kosher food is absorbed in their body. And that generates what is called the mesegra, a bad nature. As it says in the Torah, beware, be careful with the dietary laws, lest when it may bomb. When it may bomb, you will translate, lest you become tomic from them, defiled by them. But the way that word is written in the Torah is written without an olive. If it's written without an olive, it, and there are no vowels in the Torah, it can be read in a completely different way. The Nitmesem requires an olive. So it's what we call, it's chosa, it's missing a letter. It's missing some, there's an olive, missing a wolf, missing a hay, missing a yud, etc., etc. Here the olive is missing. Without the olive, which would give me an inclination of a potential vowel sound, I would have to bring in a different vowel under the men. And therefore, the Gemara says, how do we read this word, technically, the way it is written? When we tempt them, bomb. Do not beware of the uh, non-kosher foods, lest when we tempt them, bomb, you become stultified by them. Stultified. Desensitized. It, it stultifies your brain, it stultifies your heart. It desensitizes you from proper understanding, because you are what you eat. It, it desensitizes you from the religious sentiments and feelings that you should have for these values that will make you appreciate them. So, in other words, uh, it crudifies you, in plain English. And as it crudifies you, so that has an effect for the rest of your life. So, the child is not committing any sin, not doing anything wrong. But that food has become part of his body, has become part of his flesh, that is part of him. Uh, the drink is part of him. Now, one can overcome that as well, so tshuva, so this, etc., etc. But that's already a, a tougher process. So therefore, in the, in, in the basic approach, uh, it should stay away, even from earliest infancy on, because it has, it has an effect. So here, likewise, is a, on the negative side, and likewise on the positive side. Besides, uh, when it comes to appreciating mitzvahs, it's sometimes the re reasoning is not necessarily something that we appreciate. Take, for example, you have in medieval times the Rambam, in the Moira Nebuchim, and various others for him, they give what is called Tam Meha Mitzvahs, reasons for the mitzvahs. Now, whenever you look at these reasons given for the mitzvahs, by the Rambam in his time, Shimshu uh, for in his time, and so in every generation, these reasons are usually geared towards the mentality of that time. The things which are the popular mode that people appreciate in terms of their way of thinking. I laugh at most of these things today. To me, they mean nothing. That was good for 12th century. It was good for 19th century. Today, I have a completely different look at many of these things. So therefore, the reasons that are given are rationalizations for that particular time at that particular age, which can be very impressive and influence people. Take, for example, uh, circumcision. Circumcision has been argued uh, before that it prevents uh, a lot of diseases because, it, first of all, it's better for hygiene as the foreskin is cut off, so therefore the hygiene there is better when you take a shower, when you wash yourself, it's automatically, but if you have the foreskin, they're discovered, so therefore all kinds of bacteria can accumulate there. They even uh, was medically shown that uh, in married couples where the husband is circumcised, there's less cervical cancer in, in, the, in the woman. 
uh, which must be some kind of a correlation then with the foreskin, etc. Uh, but a, te- a decade ago, most of these things have been debunked, thrown out. So much so that it even came out in the medical association, the pediatric association, that there is no medical value whatsoever to circumcision. And once they came out with that, because before that, you were what, uh, 80% in America were circumcised? Today, that rate has dropped because of these reports. Um, and therefore, you have even a bunch of these uh, doctors and uh, other parents who uh, made lawsuits that uh, circumcision is child abuse, you're depriving them because it's going to diminish the sexual pleasure of the person, and therefore you're depriving them in later life through whatever you do to them uh, here and now, etc., etc., etc. Now recently, about uh, uh, last year, there came out a whole report that in Africa, that is the ep- ep- epidemic of AIDS, that in those places where people are circumcised, AIDS is not non-existent, but among, in, in those crowds, it's, it's drastically diminished. How, why, they haven't found any reason, but the stati- most of these things, they never know the reasons, all they do is start with, with statistics. Uh, so therefore, uh, obviously there is some kind of medical value. Now, I would call these rationalizations. That's not the reason why we circumcise ourselves. But when you appeal to people like that, to some pe- uh, people this will make sense. Hey, for that alone it's worth it. But these are things which go up and down. Today it's this report, today it's that report. Take any report uh, about uh, foods. Uh, what is it? Uh, two years ago I read a report how tomatoes is a wonder food. It has so many nutritious values it's in, in it, etc., etc., whatever it does, uh, the, the, and the acid, uh, what have you, uh, antioxidants, uh, and, and other things. Uh, recently I saw another report there is no value to them whatsoever. This is all overrated, if not altogether exaggerated. Uh, likewise, with, uh, with various vitamins. Uh, now they are popular. Next year come out new statistics. It's baloney. Then come out new statistics a few years later, something else. If you base it simply on these reports, uh, it's, it's a seesaw. It's a roller coaster ride, for which you will never know what is what. And that is the fallacy of, what, of, of Tamiya Mitzvahs. Um, on the other hand, Tamiya Mitzvahs, uh, through the practice thereof, um, can lead to an appreciation thereof. In the concept of Nase Nishma, which I'm sure you're familiar with, that the Jews received the Torah, they said, Nase we shall do, and then we shall examine them, and test them, and t- learn them, and try to understand them, etc., etc. Uh, what is wrong with doing them simultaneously? The answer is that the Nishma is not possible without the Nazi. There are many things where without the hands-on experience you cannot possibly appreciate and realize the value of what this thing is. So therefore, through the actual practice of the mitzvahs, even if you don't understand them, even if you don't appreciate them, even if they're a hassle, even if this and even if that, but still somehow getting into that routine, first of all you see that it's not impossible, that you can live with that, it's not, not, it's not, not such a ha- uh, problem, etc. And secondly, um, it, it will even create a certain inner peace of mind, a, a, a inner satisfaction, which is even uh, super rational, which logically may not make any sense, but still it is there. And you begin to acquire a certain sensitivity and appreciation, and even get an inkling on a sub-rational level, kind of called a subconscious level, of the, the intrinsic value that lies in the mitzvah. Besides, I can go into further mystical aspects. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, mystical, I don't mean necessarily Kabbalah Hasidus, but mystical, like, even in the sense of what Yachim Pek always, that mitzvah gereras mitzvah. That once you do a mitzvah, the person becomes refined, whether he wants to or not. The fact is, m- mitzvahs have an objective value. Mitzvahs have an objective value, even if there's no Kabbalah. Even if he didn't know that they have the right intent, just the act of the mitzvah in itself has a value. When you put on tefillin with somebody, like in the midst of tefillin, and he puts on tefillin only to do you a favor, just wants to get rid of you, stop bugging me, leave me alone. Okay, one minute, okay, fine, here, one minute. Go have a sleep there, that's it. Uh, he may think he did ch- you ch- just did you a favor, and that's it, and it has no value. The reality is, in the meantime, it was the tefillin on his hand, the tefillin on his head, he has fulfilled the mitzvah. 
It's not in the ideal fashion. It's not in the ideal manner, where it should be a living reality. But the fact is, that person is no longer a kakafta of the Lamon of feelings, no longer a skull that did not have feeling placed upon it. He's already halakhically in a completely different category. And so like this other mitzvah. There are some mitzvahs where uh, kavana is not only not relevant, but kavana becomes even uh, counterproductive. Take Stoker, for example. In Stoker, we have a law that if you lose um, a quarter, today they have the, the coin dollars, you're aping Canada finally, uh, we call them loonies, I don't know what you call them. Um, the, uh, if you lose a coin like that, a coin has no semen, has no sign that I can identify as whose it was, which means finders keepers. If you lose a coin, you didn't even, you didn't even know yet that you have lost it. And a pauper finds it, and you only found out the next day that you lost that coin. And when you found out you lost it, you say, oh shucks, darn it. But guess what? Since the pauper found it, you get credit for stocker. You didn't want to lose it. You're upset that you lost it. Etc., etc. You get credit for stocker. Because the ultimate effect of stocker that a poor person has been helped has been affected willingly or unwillingly, consciously or unconsciously, it doesn't really matter. So, why? Because this is kind of an objective. For that matter, is, you can go even a step further. There are, uh, there's a mitzvah in the Torah which you can fulfill only if you're totally unaware. And that mitzvah is even called what? Shikha, forgetfulness. What is this mitzvah of shikha? That when you harvest your, your produce in the field, and you cut the, the corn there, and you forgot a few stalks there, and you keep going, and then as it turn out, oh, I forgot a few stalks there. Sorry, buddy, you can't go back. That belongs to the poor. Later, when you make your bundles, and you take the bundles and you take them to the gallery, and then you, uh, you, you finish, and then you turn around, oh, I forgot one or two bundles over there. You can't go back, leave them there. That belongs to the poor. Which means, if you knew beforehand that you left them there, then it's not chikha. There's no mitzvah there, you, you can go back and take it. Which means that you can fulfill that only by total unawareness thereof. For that matter, mikveh. If somebody pushes you into a mikveh, with all your clothes on, and you are tormented, as you come out your torn, you didn't want to go into the mikveh, or somebody threw you into the ocean, you come out your torn. That applies even to a woman who was neither and so forth, she was thrown into the ocean, fell in there, whatever, or a, a, a big wave, uh, covered her while she's walking along the beachfront. The wave is still attached somewhere to the ground. Then she's covered. The wave has the 40 so. She's tall. Every respect. Mikve does not require any come on it. Just it happens to fall upon you the water, you fell into the water, that's it. <coughs> so there are many things <coughs> where the consciousness is, becomes totally irrelevant. Uh, of course, it's ideally there should be consciousness in whatever we do. But the mitzvah has an objective value in its own right. And therefore, even if a person doesn't feel it, if a person doesn't sense it, if a person doesn't appreciate it, I say, still do it. For, for what, because A, in the meantime, you have fulfilled the mitzvah. In the meantime, you have been uh, involved in something which is positive, as opposed to not doing anything, or never mind doing something negative. And in the meantime, uh, it, has, it is, has its effect. It's like shoving down a pill or a, a, give a child. How do you give a child uh, uh, aspirin? You have special children's aspirin. What are children's aspirin? Aspirin covered with candy coating. The child thinks it's taking a candy. For the child, all he knows, I have the candy. Oh, this candy, sure I'll take this candy. So you smuggle it in. In the meantime, the aspirin is in the body. So here likewise is the mitzvah. In the meantime, the aspirin is in the body. The aspirin is in your mind, the aspirin is in your neshama. Something has, has been affected. So yes, if there is no appreciation of that, it still has its effect. It's not on the ideal uh, way, it's not the, it could be more forceful, uh, the more mind involvement there is, the more forceful is the effect of it, but nonetheless, it has an objective value in its own right, what and therefore should be pursued. What about the exact opposite? If you give someone money, money but, and you have the intent for it to be stuck up, but the guy really has a lot of these two in the are you still... Yes, uh, this is mentioned in many Sorim, and they say, yes, we will be cheated. Uh, you, you have been tricked, you have been cheated, etc., etc. But guess what? 
it stands to your benefit. Uh, because then you can say uh, 